<laughs> Hi guys, now welcome to chapter 10. Glad you're still uh, 10 or 12 people on the planet still with me. Chapter 10 from Peruvian Plunge, where we find ourselves deep in the heart of the Peruvian Amazon at Manu Wildlife Center Eco Lodge where the honeymoon is over on Sunday, May 31st, 2009. But we're going to kick off chapter 10 with a quote from none other than Sancho Panza. Sancho Panza from uh, around the year 1605. <clears throat> quote, each of us is as God made him and often much worse. Thank you, Sancho Panza, for those wise words of advice. Okay, let's dive in in the last day of May of 2009. <clears throat> the first faint cracks in my happy honeymoon with Kurt Cedar Ratchetta began to form 18 hours after we had first laid eyes on each other. Walking to a cold, dreary Sunday morning, I don't know who started the ridiculous rumor that the Amazon rainforest is hot. Obviously, someone who had never been there. I thought it would be best if I checked in with Kurt Sita to see if there was anything I could do for her. My legitimate excuse for being there at all was still shaky, to say the least, so I thought it would be to my advantage to suck up to my boss. I found Kurt Sita behind her desk, chain-smoking cigarettes. Miguel, the guide from the day before who had shot me down with his cold glances, was also in the room, tapping away at a computer. I sat down in a comfortable chair and chirped, Buenos dias! No response from Kurt Sita, just a probing once-over scowl before she returned to whatever she was doing before I entered the room. An uncomfortable silence descended over her well-appointed office. I fidgeted in my chair, wondering what to do or say to break the tension. Instead, Miguel broke the silence by asking Kurt Sita, with a nod and snarl in my direction, how long the damn fool over in the chair was planning to be at the lodge. She answered two months, and Miguel rolled his eyes in disgust. Tick, tick, tick. The tension must have worked its way through to Kurt Sita because she, w she soon sat down what she was doing and regarded me coldly. In halting Spanglish, she informed me that volunteers were expected to create their own jobs and that it was not her job to fill up my day. I am afraid you will be bored here, she cautioned me. Reed, why don't you go back where you came from? I had the sudden epiphany that my best course of action was to stay the hell out of Kurt Sita's and Miguel's way as best I could if I knew what was good for me. I assured Kurt Sita that I would never get bored at such a beautiful place, and to demonstrate that, I got the hell out of her office to go find something to do on a rainy Sunday morning in the middle of nowhere. Although the weather was not exactly what one would call conducive to jungle exploring, I capitulated to my fate. You're in a damn rainforest, Hambone. Get used to it. I uh, wrapped up in my flimsy little plastic trash bag of a poncho and set off again in search of high jungle adventure. I spied an inviting little bridge crossing the creek behind Miranda's bungalow and decided to follow it. Some 100 feet beyond the bridge, I rounded a bend in the trail and I was swallowed up in the pristine glory of my first taste of what the Amazon rainforest is supposed to feel like. Perhaps 50 feet above my head, the closed canopy of the forest was so thick that little rain penetrated through the leaves, though it seemed like every leaf in the jungle was dropping, was dripping water. 
as there was no sun, there were, unfortunately, no shadows either. Nonetheless, the chilly mist and dripping trees cast a certain Pleistocene vibe over the forest that I found quite enchanting in a spooky sort of way. In many ways, the forest was similar to the jungle Merino and I had tropped through, with one major difference. Spaced every 100 to 200 feet throughout the woods, humongous tree trunks would shoot straight up through the roof of the dense canopy to disappear in the mist above the greenery. I would crane my neck upward from the base of these monsters, but usually could only just catch a glimpse of the crown of branches and leaves, which frequently did not even sprout from the massive trunks until well above the lower roof of the canopy. I could see why botanists called these granddaddies of the forest emergence. That's exactly what they, they did. They emerged from the rolling carpet of greenery above my head to spread their branches, each the size of a normal sized tree trunk, into a glorious crown above the surrounding treetops. The problem was I was in the wrong position, i.e. on the ground looking up to appreciate the majesty of the jungle giants. Picking my way through the deep muck, I soon came upon a small sign indicating that the canopy tower could be found on my left. Yes! I continued up the trail, just gawking at all the greenery around me, until I stumbled upon a truly spectacular sight. My first giant Amazon strangler fig. I had a few, I had seen a few strangler figs before in Costa Rica, but nothing like this monster. The strangler fig in no way related <coughs> to what we know as a fig <coughs> in the U.S. is one of the strangest plants in all of the rainforest. It starts out as a vine on the forest floor, which it attaches itself to one of the big emergent trees. I'm no biologist, despite what Elizabeth Vargas may think, so I don't know how long it takes one of these little vines to get to the top of the tree. When it finally does reach the top, it sends out shoots, which in turn free fall back down through the air, all the way back down to the forest floor where the entire process began. These free swinging vines take root a few feet from the roots of the parent vine thereby forming an independent trunk stretching from the ground to the top of the original tree. Are you following me here? Over the years and decades and centuries, more and more of these vine trees surround the original that supported the very first parent vine, and before you know it, the original tree has literally been strangled by all the invaders and eventually dies from this strangulation. By this time, the once flimsy vines have become so rigid and huge that they themselves morph into their own self-standing tree. The end result is a wild, tangled mass of giant woody vines all wrapped around each other and spiraling heavenward to the sunlight at the top of the forest, which was the goal all along. A smaller version of this tree called the Banyan tree exists in the extreme southern U.S., one of the biggest of which shades my mama's grave in Fort Myers, Florida. <clears throat> As if all of this riot of growth were not enough, hundreds if not thousands 
of bromeliads and orchids festooned the branches of this remarkable forest giant, creating an entire micro-ecosystem in just one tree. And millions upon millions of these magnificent trees, and of course dozens of other species, used to stretch all the way from the Andes to the Atlantic Ocean, covering an area almost as big as the continental U.S. I walked around and around the base of this natural wonder, which probably measured some 20 feet in diameter, marveling at how Gaia came up with such a remarkable system. The call of the canopy was too strong to resist, however, so I reluctantly pulled myself away and continued down the trail. Perhaps another three blocks along the Creekside Trail, the Canopy Tower finally came into view. They weren't kidding when they said tower. Hugging the right side of a truly magnificent specimen of Kapok tree, was a monster metal spiral staircase that wound around and around a central metal pole so as not to gorge the tree itself for 144 steps, which led me huffing and puffing into the rainforest canopy for the first time in my life. The staircase opened up onto a two-tiered wooden platform looking all the world like any other treehouse, except this treehouse was ten stories in the air. Catching my breath, I gazed out over the canopy for my maiden monkey's eye view of the jungle, only to be, well, and I don't know how to break it to you after all this building up, a wee bit disappointed. There were two reasons for this initial letdown. <clears throat> One, of course, was the rain. Now that I was above the umbrella of the thick canopy, now 50 feet below me, I was getting soaked. Meanwhile, the other emergent trees in the surrounding forest were hidden behind veils of mist. More than the rain, however, my disappointment had to do with the simple fact that my ground-dweller genes could not comprehend <clears throat> the sheer magnificent scale of what I was witnessing. In a half century of plodding around on the ground, I had never been in this situation before, except in high-rise buildings, of course, Despite the fact that I was more than 100 feet from the ground, you need to picture the fact that the tops of the lower trees <clears throat> were anywhere from 30 to 50 feet below me, and their canopy was so dense it gave me the impression that their tops were, in fact, the ground. <clears throat> I need some water here. Therefore, it didn't feel like I was that high up. Adding to this disorientation was the fact that the rolling canopy below me, the different heights of the lower trees made the ground seem to roll made me feel like I was sitting perhaps 30 feet in the air looking over low rolling hills. The other giant emergence in the near distance appeared to be oak-sized trees on ridge lines, not other 150-foot tall trees sprouting from a level playing field. The whole gestalt was disorienting, to put it mildly. Don't get me wrong, the view from the top was beautiful. It just felt like it was the view from the top of a 30-foot oak tree in Texas, not the view from 10 stories up the side of a kapok tree in the Peruvian Amazon. 
And I, I just need to break the narrative for just a minute for those of you trying to figure out what a KPOC, it's otherwise known as a SEBA, C-E-I-B-A is another <clears throat> name for these trees. If you saw uh, the movie Avatar, if you remember the, I think it was called the Spirit Tree, that was a big feature in that movie that the Spirit Tree in Avatar uh, was in fact a Kapok tree. And I wonder if it was actually the very Kapok tree uh, that I was in. Um, just to so say you know uh, what a Kapok tree looks like. Okay, back to the story. <clears throat> Although I would have to acquire a taste for the view over repeated trips up the tower, the tree itself was truly magnificent in every sense of the word. To start with, the bottom of the huge trunk was supported by massive winged buttresses that flared out in all directions to keep the giant from toppling over and the deceptively thin clay soils, it would have easily taken a dozen or more people to form a chain around the tree at ground level. The trunk emerged from the crown of buttresses perhaps 12 feet above the ground. From that point, and for the next 90 feet or so, the silvery smooth barked trunk shot straight up in the air toward the sunshine, not wasting any energy on branches until the massive tree was well above its neighbors. The trunk did not taper down like a redwood tree, but held its magnificent eight-foot diameter for the entire distance. The wooden platform was nestled into the crown of the tree some ten stories above the ground. The crown was the center of the action. From it sprang six humongous branches, every one of them with the girth of a granddaddy live oak that spiraled upward yet another thirty feet above the crown and some 50 feet outward in every direction. The end result was a glorious ring of giant branches forming a leafy round cathedral some 100 feet across from branch tip to branch tip. Try imagining the biggest live oak you have ever seen and setting that huge oak atop a 10-story tall trunk before the first branches start to spread. The effect is so disorienting that a ground dweller literally cannot process it upon first seeing it. And as if this were not enough, just like the strangler fig, virtually every one of the huge branches was covered in bromeliads, orchids, ferns, staghorns, philodendrons, succulents, moss, lichens, an entire ecosystem completely invisible from the ground was thriving in the rain and sunshine of the uppermost regions of the canopy. I stood there alone at the top of the world, trying in vain to soak it all in, but it was simply too much to process in one trip. As the rain began pelting me, I promised the tree I would return on a brighter day. Right now, as my stomach was reminding me, it was time for a gourmet lunch. Kurtzita Ratchetta had a list of questions and grievances waiting for me when I joined her for lunch. First item of business was the letter from Elizabeth Vargas that she had given me to read the night before. The one about the young biologist from Costa Rica coming to Manu to study the wildlife there. You aren't a biologist 
are you? She asked accusingly, the obvious insinuation being that I had lied to get into the lodge. I assured her that I was not a biologist and had never said that I was. What I had told Elizabeth was that I was going to be in Costa Rica working with McCall's, which was the real story, and would therefore be late for my April 1st appointment. She filed that away in her bullshit registry and went on to her next item, my ambiguous job description at Manu Wildlife Center. One of Kurt Sita's many jobs at the lodge was to, to greet the predominantly English-speaking tourists when they first arrived to give them a briefing of how things worked at Manu Wildlife Center. Don't flush the toilet paper, dinner at seven, blah, blah, blah. She did this by explaining things point by point in Spanish after which an English-speaking guide would translate what she just said into broken English. Kurtzita thought correctly that it would be more efficient if I took over this briefing duty with the guest, and I readily agreed. In addition to handling the introductory briefing, Kurtzita asked that I be the English-speaking point man if any of the guests had questions or problems. No problem, I assured her. Next on her agenda was the timing of my English classes. The only two available times in the staff's highly regimented day were either 3 p.m. when all of the guys escaped to their soccer game on the other side of the river or 9 p.m. when all of the guys were exhausted after a long day's work. I told her I would offer classes at both of these times so the guys could choose. Of course, they could choose to attend neither of these classes as they were entirely voluntary. Kurt Sita agreed that that sounded reasonable she told me she would be there for my 9 p.m. classes. We further agreed that the classes would begin Monday, the next day, at 3 p.m. Last, but by no means least on her agenda, was the disturbing report she had heard that morning that I had chosen to make my home in the derelict Boa bungalow, not in one of the nicely appointed tourist cabins. That would never work, she said, as the rip in the screen would invite unwelcome visitors from the jungle during the night. More than mosquitoes or vampire bats, she seemed especially concerned that Boa would be invaded by possums. I had heard her mention this possum invasion in her briefing when we had arrived the day before, but paid it little attention. She cavalierly announced that I would have to move to Bubo, Spanish for owl, ASAP. Bubo, of course, was probably the single least private cabin of all. As politely as I could, I told Kurt Sita that I really, really would prefer to stay in Boa, possums or no possums. Stung by this challenge to her authority, <clears throat> she tried to shoot me down with her most eviscerating, emasculating scowl that she could muster. But I stood firm in my resolve. Amazingly, I won this first stare-down contest, and she said she would have the screen fixed, but in the meantime, I would have to pack up all my shit and move it to the fishbowl of Bubo. It will only be for two days, I promise, she assured me. Two days, my ass. I knew the definition of two hours in Peru and didn't believe this crap for two seconds.
after lunch, she followed me back to Boa to make sure that I complied with her order. Reluctantly, I packed up all of my belongings and she marched me down to Bubo, which I immediately rechristened Butthole. This is so much nicer than Boa, she assured me, indicating the intact screen, the polished floors, the well-appointed bathroom, and the curtains that serve the dual purpose of blocking all views of the jungle while also offering privacy from the other bungalows that surrounded butthole like cookie-cutter subdivision homes. That task out of the way, Kurtzita tromped off to put out what other fire needed her hose. Home sweet home in butthole Peru. To work off my, indig my indignation of being forced out of Boa, I decided to explore the trail leading off into the jungle along the banks of the Madre de Dios River. <clears throat> Again, Within 30 seconds of leaving the manicured lawns and gardens, I was transported into another galaxy. The towering trees and the pure life that enveloped me soon melted away my bad mood. In a few minutes, I arrived at an even more spectacular strangler fig than the one from the previous day. I sat there for at least 15 minutes just gawking at the mastery of Mother Earth's handiwork. A troop of spider monkeys, the first of my life, soon caught my attention. Even more than the capuchin monkeys, the spider monkeys and their long prehensile tails as extra use prehensile tails as extra arms to swing through the canopy like circus acrobats in the treetops above me. But clearly, they had no fear of me. The first whine of a late afternoon mosquito reminded me that I had forgotten my repellent, so I reluctantly turned back for home. <clears throat> Halfway back to Butthole, I encountered Miguel, leading two tourists down the same trail I had just been walking on. They were headed to the giant fig tree. I told them to be sure to check out the troop of spider monkeys just beyond the giant tree. Miguel regarded me with utter scorn and announced that was exactly what he planned to do. I returned home to Butthole and rounded out the balance of my afternoon, setting up housekeeping in a house I did not want to keep. Kurtzita Ratchetta was her old, flirtatious, chatty self at dinner. I assumed the brewing storm had passed until suddenly, after dessert, she announced that she had some things to discuss with me in her office. <clears throat> to make sure there was no miscommunication between us, she invited Miranda to translate the conversation. With Miranda literally between the two of us, Kurtzita explained that I was to stay off the trails when <clears throat> guides were leading tourists on nature walks, which was pretty much every day. She had heard reports that my presence on the trails was scaring the wildlife, a reference to the troop of spider monkeys that I saw on the trail, the same monkeys that the tourist that Miguel was leading did not see. <clears throat> Obviously, Obviously, the reason the tourist did not see <clears throat> the monkeys was because I had scared them off into the jungle. I was just about to explain that the real reason that the touristas did not see the monkeys, which were clearly not afraid of me, was because of Miguel's constant prattling to the tourist. 
but somehow I held my tongue. That settled, she next announced that she would not be needing my services for the briefing. <clears throat> Finally, I would be used as an English-speaking point man as an absolute last resort, unless my assistance was requested by Kurt Sita herself, I was not to speak to, look at, or in any way bother the paying tourist. She says she is just being honest, Miranda translated. Other than those small items, Everything was just hunky-dory between Kurt Sita and me, and she looked forward to my first English class the following night. Buenas noches, she finished up, dismissing me and Miranda with a wave of her hand. <clears throat> I plodded back through the rain and thick muck to butthole to hide behind the curtains that shielded me from the sight of my neighbors. Sight, yes, but sound, no. As everyone settled down for the night, the various sounds of voices, radios, belches, farts, and worst of all, snores joined the chorus of crickets and frogs. Butthole was so close to the next door cabin that the snores Assaulting my ears drove me into my bag of cannonballs to retrieve my earplugs. Shutting out the sound of the soft rain against the roof along with the snoring, I finally drifted off to sleep in the bowels of butthole, wondering once again what the fuck I was doing with my life. That brings us to the end of chapter 10, onward to chapter 11, coming up.